Thank you so much. That was a great overview of supracondylar humerus fractures. Um, so I'm going to debate myself now because I have two cases here. One is a case that I think would have been just fine to treat non-operatively, but in fact went for pins. And then another case that was treated non-operatively that most definitely should have been treated with surgery. So hopefully that made sense. Okay, so we'll start off. And of course, we all know what to do with the type ones and we all know what to do with the type threes, but it's the ones in the middle here that create, I think the most um, distress. So this is the type two that was operative, but could have been non-operative. So it's a three-year-old female who fell off a high chair. Um, and so it was just the standard uh, foosh on an outstretched elbow. And um, she was splinted and sent home from the emergency room to from an outside emergency department. And then she came to me for outpatient surgery. So I, this is basically because I'm I, I'm in the camp where I basically pin all type twos, but in this instance, I can see how it would have worked either way. So on her physical examination, she's a well child. Um, she just had mild elbow swelling, uh, neurocirculatory exam was intact. And then I do have final follow-up. She's basically back to normal, but. So here's an injury film. So we see our AP and lateral where you notice that there's a little bit of, um, well, shoot, I guess I don't have a mouse. You can, you can notice a little bit of comminution um, in the column there. And then there's that extended view. And we take her to the operating room and she gets these pins. And I just wanna point out here, this is the reason why I'm sure it would be fine non-op is because this is not a stable pin construct. <laughs> we have one that's intramedullary. We have really narrow, um, start site. There's an okay spread at the fracture site, but the start site, they're pretty darn narrow. And then we've got the um, lesser pin, the shorter one is going basically right into that comminution. So I look at that and I think, well, it's basically a band-aid. <laughs> and then of course she does amazing and heals fine and doesn't have an issue. Um, Dr. Schreiber's point about lateral x-rays is very well taken. And you can see here that this isn't the best lateral x-ray, but overall she ends up doing great. She's three, pretty much anything would have worked. So now I'll move on to a, a case that was not mine to start, but I inherited and it was non-op and should have been treated as operative. So this patient is nine. So um, immediately we see the difference in age. Um, a nine-year-old elbow is much less forgiving than a three-year-old elbow. But he was referred to me for a cubitus ferrous deformity that, that occurred after his fracture. So his was the type 2B, um, was a skateboard injury, and um, the injury had occurred a year before he came to me, but I have the whole history of x-rays to show you. Um, he really didn't have any functional issues. His range of motion was interesting, but it wasn't limiting in any way, and he didn't have any uh, other neurocirculatory issues. It was more of a cosmetic problem, I think, on the, on the, um, in the opinion of the parents. So he's a well child. And on his exam, he had cubitus varus of about 14 degrees on the right side, and then a left arm cubitus valgus of eight. So that gives you a total difference side to side of 22 degrees. Um, and that's, that's too much. That's a lot of, um, asymmetry. So the right elbow hyperextended a tremendous amount more than the left side, but he still was able to flex to 130 and he was quite functional. He did have asymptomatic subluxation of his ulnar nerve, which you could palpate and visualize underneath the skin uh, just with a flexion and extension arc. And even though it wasn't symptomatic at rest or play, if you did a tunnels at right at the cubital tunnel, it did produce significant tingling in the, in the cubital tunnel, whereas on the other side, it didn't. So here is his um, injury x-ray where you can see, we again have a really terrible lateral and um, kind of a funny oblique-ish AP. So he's in the emergency room and he gets splinted and um, it looks like my, when I transferred this over to this computer, my, um, my Bauman's lines were lower, but you can imagine if the Bauman's 
the, the Bauman's line were up near the Capitolum, it, you could see that it's 90 degrees. And then again, on the lateral, which is still not great, but it's anti the hum anterior humeral line is really not intersecting and it should in a nine-year-old. So he comes to uh, an orthopedic doctor for um, treatment and it was decided to do non-operative care. And so there was a reduction done in the, in the office where the patient was placed into a cast. And this is kind of the um, flat back cast we talk about, which has a little bit of a flat um, area just posterior to the distal humerus. And we try to do hyperflexion when there's a flat back cast. Um, again, I'm sorry that my lines didn't transfer very well when I uploaded it onto this computer, but um, you can see that the anterior humeral line is actually better on this lateral, but Bauman's angle is only marginally better. So then the kid returns in a week and I put these lines to point out that now the swelling has gone down. So you can see how much space is available around the edges of the cast between the cast and the skin. And we see too that we've basically lost reduction, whatever reduction had been gained. Um, so he was placed into a new flat back cast and the um, sagittal plane was improved again. And then he comes back at four weeks. And of course it was back to the original displacement. Um, and then he's followed for months after that until he is basically united and malunited essentially. So this is just how things kind of unfolded from there. And you can already see here on this um, EP that there's a varus malalignment. Dr. So, Michael, just um, to, can I ask you a quick question from the chat? Yeah. Um, someone wants to know how much angulation is acceptable and how do you, ex uh, how do you assess rotation intraoperatively? Um, okay, so I didn't obviously take this kid to the operating room, but I use my lateral, lateral medial column views to assess rotation in the, in the operating room. Um, now in the office, it can be kind of difficult actually, because especially when they're in cubitus varus, and I find that having the patient, um, let me see if I can demonstrate for you, but having the patient just go like this is not sufficient. It, it can give you an idea about their carrying angle, but I actually prefer to have the patient do this with their palms down and this with their palms up. And then I compare side to side. And I always wanna know what's happening on the other side to know what is typical for that particular patient. Does that answer your question? I think so. Okay, and then maybe Dr. Schreiber would want to add what she does. I, I agree with you. So in the OR, usually the, the, I think the obliques are really, really important. Um, a little bit of rotation actually is acceptable because that we have seen that that actually remodels. Um, and then again, I do what um, Dr. McMichael said, I do um, the, uh, the same thing with the rotation in the office. I have the carrying angles first and then I do the same way. I actually have them stretch their arms out and then go basically both ways. But I think, if sorry for okay. muting you, your internet's going crazy. <laughs> I keep going, Dr. McMichael. Okay, so, um, well, that was the end of that case, but I think it just points out some important things that we have to keep in mind. Type twos actually can heal without surgery. They require a reduction. They require a really nicely molded cast and very close follow-up. And so if you have the optimal patient, which in my opinion would be three years old or less, maybe four if they're, you know, really a good cooperative type family. So you can have frequent follow-up and making sure that the cast doesn't get loose. Um, otherwise I will just proudly own that I really love pinning supercondylars. Nothing <laughs> makes me sleep better at night than pinning a supercondylar. <laughs> so.